Your Excellency, Ambassador Harris, dear Ian Reddy, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, as Deputy Director General of the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, it's my great pleasure and privilege to give you a very warm welcome here to this today's evening event. The title of the event is The Grass Grass Catcher, in German Geister im Transitraum der Erinnerung. I'm honored that the writer of the standing and reputation of Jan Wedi has agreed to give a reading and discuss his work in our library. And I'm delighted that I can present today's events as a cooperative effort which we have organized together with the Internationales Literaturfestival Berlin and the New Zealand Embassy. As you know, of course, a library could not exist without books. Today, one should rather say without media of all kinds. But neither could a library exist without readers. It's our central mission to provide our readers with comfortable access to broad range of media and information sources, old and new, analog and digital. But at Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, we think interaction with our readers should not stop there. The overall objective of our Werkstattgespräche, that's the name of the event that gives a frame of this uh, evening, and it's uh, organized by our academic service. This objective is to create a forum for ongoing dialogue between our library and its readers. Most of our readers are scholars and academics, and hence, many of our Werkstattgespräche deal with topics of academic interest, sometimes more generally, sometimes from a highly specialized perspective. However, there are those rare and special instances which draw a link between the library's resources and collections, new ways of using this collection, and a broader cultural context. Ian Weddy's own books are, of course, part of Staatsbibliothek's collection. But as far as I know, he used also our collection for his research. And I'm convinced that the topic of today's reading will open up all kinds of avenue for intercultural engagement and exchange. I've just said, that the primary mission of Staatsbibliothek is to provide our readers with the best possible service. However, another central function of a major international library like ours is to use its rich resources to contribute to the cultural life of international city like Berlin. Hence, the international context of today's reading, the Jagd is zu Ende, <laughs> could hardly be more appropriate. New Zealand and Germany are separated, what did you say, 2,000 kilometers, 20,000 kilometers? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, and it takes long time to travel back and forth. However, New Zealand is a vital cultural presence in Germany, in Berlin particular, and not at least in our library. If you research our catalog, you will find thousands of titles that reflect to New Zealand. Among them, the works of all major writers from New Zealand. So an event like today's highlights impressively that a library, just like cultural and literature in general, is indeed a global affair. Let me once give again my sincere thanks to the New Zealand Embassy, to the Internationales Literaturfestival Berlin, and of course 
to Ian Vetti to make this event possible. And at least I should say thank you to my colleagues who organized that. So I'm looking forward to an interesting evening. I'm excited to listen about CRAS catchers. And uh, I would like to pass now the word to uh, His Excellency Ronnie Harris, please. I think we should try to speak each other's languages. So I'm going to say a few very brief remarks in German, if you will permit me to. Dr. Finger, Dr. Haug, vielen Dank, dass Sie heute Abend in Kooperation mit dem Internationalen Literaturfestival Berlin unsere Gastgeber bei dieser Veranstaltung in der weltbekannten Stadtbibliothek zu Berlin sind. Neuseeland trägt heute Abend zwei, zwei Dinge bei. Den Wein, von dem ich hoffe, dass Sie ihn alle probieren werden, und eine unserer bekanntesten und bedeutendsten Autoren, Ian Wedde. Als junger Student bin ich seinen Schriften zum ersten Mal an der Universität Auckland begegnet, während ich unter anderem deutsche Literatur studierte. Aber ich hätte damals nie gedacht, dass ich ihn eines Tages in Berlin im richtigen Leben treffen würde. Und das ist für mich eine persönliche Ära. Meine Damen und Herren, Sie sind heute Abend gekommen, um Herrn Wedi zuzuhören, nicht mir. Aber ich möchte noch auch zwei weitere hier anwesende, vollbekannte Neuseeländer hinweisen. Die erste ist Donna Marlene, eine preisgekrönte Drehbuchautorin und Schriftstellerin und Greg Simo, der neue neuseeländische Gastkünstler. Ich wünsche Ihnen einen sehr schönen Abend. Thank you very much, Ambassador Harris. Uh, now it's my pleasant duty to introduce tonight's uh, protagonist to you. Ian Weddy is many, many things. He's a poet, novelist, critic, academic, traveler, and I suppose it's safe to say a true cosmopolitan. Uh, born in Blenheim, New Zealand, uh, he spent, uh, I think, the major part of his childhood in, in what was then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, and in England. Uh, graduated from the University of Auckland and began publishing poetry soon afterwards in 1966. What then followed was an extended period of travel, once again in the Middle East, um, and uh, the first milestone, you could say, of his literary career was the 1975 publication uh, of Pathway to the Sea, um, a very significant long poem. From the mid-70s onwards, Ian Weddy um, began publishing fiction uh, prominently. Uh, his first novel, Dick Seddon's Great Dive, uh, for which he won the New Zealand Book Award for Fiction. Many more novels and poetry collections followed. Um, <clears throat> one that deserves, in my opinion, special mention is uh, Simmer's Hole, 1986, which is widely regarded as one of the most important modern New Zealand novels. Beginning in the 1980s, Ian Weddy also worked as an art critic and curator uh, with many, many high-profile assignments in leading New Zealand museums and cultural institutions. Um, today, to date, there have been six novels, more than ten collections of poetry, and Ian Weddy also has edited several major poetry anthologies, the Penguin uh, Book of New Zealand verse among them, um, and published numerous articles, essays, and reviews. Um, most recently, um, Ian Weddy has also been New Zealand Poet Laureate between 2011 and 2013, and even more recently, um, he spent a year in Berlin, where he was writer in residence on the Creative New Zealand Fellowship, and um, his sojourn in Berlin was uh, the occasion of our happy meeting and of um, sort of the, the origin of today's event. Um, I think Ian has found uh, some inspiration in Berlin, and I'm excited to hear uh, the results of these. And now I would like to hand over to Ian Weddy, who will read extracts from two new works, one already published, one still in progress, and after each two bits of reading, we will have some time for questions and discussions. Ian Weddy, thank you very much. Stock.
Um, perhaps I should also speak in German, but um, I'm going to be lazy this evening and, um, and not do so. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's wonderful. It, this is a complicated occasion, and um, it's thanks to um, the Staatsbibliothek, uh, Dr. Fenger, uh, my friend uh, Jochen Hau, um, the New Zealand Embassy, of course, the uh, International Festival. It, it, I feel very honoured to be the object of this attention, um, this rather complex occasion, and a little bit daunted. So. Um, yeah, thanks to all of you for putting this together, and um, thank you all for coming. Um, I've I've got two uh, lots of stuff here, as uh, as as Jochen pointed out, um, and I don't want to talk about it too much in advance, but I just want to say that they they are kind of linked in a way. This is a book that's just recently been published, and I'm happy to say that there are copies available uh, for you if you want them outside, of quite close to the wine. <laughs> so, um, and this book is called The Grass Catcher, which um, I, I did hear a translation of the term grass catcher, which sounded to me like one of those wonderful compound German nouns that I admire so much, which are the the kind of substantial, um, the substantial meme fragment of German philosophy and poetry, the, the condensed word that can do so much. Um, how would you say grass catcher in German? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the, the grass catcher um, arises as a title because I wanted not to write about my life, about a memoir, although by default this happens. I wanted to write about what it is that we think through and what it is that we do in our thoughts when we try and establish what we mean by home and how we know that we're there and how we know what that means, because it's not simple. And of course, in one way, it is entirely simple. Home is where your, for example, where your family is, where your children are. But even that, I suggest, is not always as simple as it seems. And, um, and so the book really was an attempt to think through what it is to be at home. And I had a, quite a complicated uh, home experience as a, as, a, as a child and as a young man. And I think it's gone on being complicated because of that background. Um, um, as Jochen pointed out, I've lived in different parts of the world when I was little and moved around a lot. And so I think there's a certain connection through that with my German ancestors on my German side, my father's side, who came from Schleswig-Holstein, my great-grandmother Maria Riepen, who came by herself as a young woman of 24 to New Zealand in 1876, probably spoke no English. I mean, extraordinary stories, I think. Mine is, the story of Maria is not unusual, but it's extraordinary, and my Scottish ancestors also. Um, and so I think there is a, there is a common experience that um, is involved in this kind of restlessness or this, this kind of immigration um, this transferring of your sense of home to the other side of the world. And so I'd, I, I'll just read a, a, a short series of snippets from The Grass Catcher, and, and then perhaps we'll see if anyone wants to talk about it uh, a bit more. My first home, which I shared with my twin brother David, was our mother's womb. I seem to know in my cells that bargaining took place there and during the events that led to our moving in. Which of us would be left-handed? Which of us would have sons but not daughters and vice versa? Which of us would have a sanguine nature 
and which that of a fantasist. In one way or another, this home and the trading that went on during our time there shaped our individual and collective identities, our fates, the fantasist might have added, while his sanguine brother basked calmly in whatever present he was enjoying. My brother left this home first by 20 minutes, long enough for me to get the long suffering expression that appears in most photographs of us as infants and little boys. Dave was strongly built with a handsome, solid boned frame, square head, and a wide delighted smile for the world. His twin, on the other hand, was slighter with a notoriously rosebud mouth. My first affectionately disparaging nickname was Rosebud and a forehead of foppish curls. An early memory, the smell of the spit with which my mother sculpted these ornaments. And my habitual expression if the photographs are to be believed was querulous and introspective as if an internal world or narrative kept distracting me from the obvious pleasures of the one out there. I believe without reason, of course, that the companion of my first exile didn't really notice what had happened. I'm sure I loved him then in the weird astigmatic way that twins do, but I may also have wished he had doubts about the situation we were in, as I did, instead of always beating me to the sunshine by at least 20 minutes. A family story, embedded deeply enough in my consciousness to have become something like a memory, concerns an event that was at once my revenge on my twin's diasporic equanimity and my acknowledgement that he felt pain differently from me. Our second home, after our mother's womb, was our maternal grandmother's house in Francis Street, Blenheim, where our mother and father also lived. Nana Horn, Agnes or Aggie Horn, nay Tate, would take us for walks in our double wickerwork pram and one day was alarmed by bellows of pain from the sunny-natured David. It was usually me who did the shrieking. After close inspection, she discovered that the thumb his brother was sucking, was gnashing with a sharp new tooth, was not mine, but his. I wish I could recover the illicit pleasure of this displaced gratification, which involved my brother feeling my pain for me while I stole his comfort. At the same time, I know, guiltily, that something like this displacement would become my default imaginative condition, how I inhabited the first home out there in the world, about which 60-something years later I can claim to remember anything. Of course, I can't really remember the notorious thumb-sucking and biting incident which the family enshrined as a tribal joke while simultaneously deploying it as a forensic lens on my developing character. Nor, of course, can my brother remember what happened. He, however, is certain that it was my thumb that he was serenely sucking and biting as I shrieked. What Dave's memory does to my version of the family's narrative is, of course, twist it away from the direction I want it to go in, away from the evolution of the duplicitous nature that serves my story best, that contrasts my perplexity about home with Dave's equanimity. A few years ago, I was writing about the road trip photographs of Peter Black and recalling the dreamlike world that passed the car's windows when I was a child, and especially the indistinct fragmentary world that appeared in the headlights as we drove home at night from a family outing, and in writing this memory down as a gloss on Peter's photographs, I was suddenly returned to something far stronger than a vague memory out of childhood. I encountered then, again, with a shock, as if through a portal to another dimension or reality, the image of the lawnmowers 
battered wire and canvas grass catcher hanging on the wall at the back of the garage and lit by the car's headlamps. As a child, the strangeness of this object verged on the terrifying. I looked at it with a shudder of fear and pleasure. Its fantastic weirdness had a lot to do with its ordinary familiarity. It looked like nothing on earth and like my father's grass catcher, the one attached to the chattering mower that he pushed up and down the front lawn, trying to make regular stripes of the mown nap, straightening out the warped world. I saw that the thing he pushed through summer's pleasant aroma of mown grass and the thing on the back wall of the garage, momentarily lit by the headlamps, were the same and were in the same world, but could be utterly different. The thing was not singular. And it was these differences, these uncanny lurches away from what was ordinary and familiar, these haunting, enchanting, mesmerizing splits that changed the world I played in with my twin brother. When the headlights lit up the grass catcher, this object at once known and unknowable, we had finally reached home. This was how I knew. I arrived home then, and it was both a comforting place I lived in with my family and a place whose spookiness excited me into a kind of private trance. And again, many years later, when I remembered the grass catcher, I arrived at a place that was at once homely and unheimlich. While Dave enjoyed tranquil sleep in the bed next to mine, I would pound on the wall to our parents' bedroom because there really was something in the big wardrobe and it was surely going to come out any minute now. Their weary, muffled reply was, go back to sleep, it's only a dream. Go back to sleep. That was where the dreams were, and what reason did I have not to believe them? On my journey to discover these home places, I will need the grass catcher to guide me to them, and my ghost fragments to guide me to the self I was when I was there, a self that may often have been a version of the counterfeiter who used his twin brother's pain to secure his own pleasure. Will I recognize these places called home and the dissembling play actor who lived in them? Can my own experience teach me anything about the experiences of others in the places I called home? How was it for them? This is what I need to find out. And now I'll jump on uh, to um, a story about my great uncle Fritz, uh, one of the nine children of Maria Riepen and Heinrich August, who was one of the family stories that I learnt about um, towards the end of my father's life. Great uncle Fritz. How does memory lie? Or rather, what kind of truth does memory promise? Does it make any sense to treat one of my ancestors, my great uncle Frederick Alexander Weddy, known by the family as Fritz, as the divining rod through which some kind of memory is recovered or encouraged to flow into the present where I'm thinking about home? What home could Fritz possibly tell me about? Almost nothing is known about his own though the family has generated a collective romance about him ending up in Mexico. So Fritz disappeared shortly before the First World War broke out. There was a lot of speculation about what happened. And then in the 50s, he wrote a letter and contacted the family. I don't know which member of the family Fritz dropped his bombshell letter on, in the 1950s, when he announced that he was still alive, <coughs> living in Mexico, was intestate, 
and very wealthy, and looking to find out the names and locations of his relations, the likely inheritors of his estate. Some family members seem to have begun a disordered quest for what soon became a fabled fortune. <coughs> Excuse me. When my father died, I found among his papers a file of correspondence with lawyers in San Francisco and Dunedin and a bank in Eagle Pass, Texas, which showed that in the 1960s, he'd taken on the apparently thankless task of coordinating the family's quest tracking down and arranging for the distribution of the by then deceased Fritz's assets. Fritz's initial letter doesn't survive, as far as I know, and it seems to have been addressed to his relatives in the King Country. Dorothy Bennett, a granddaughter of Fritz's sister, Bertha, subsequently began a correspondence with the British Vice Consul in Torrion. Chick's file, it's my father's file, filled mostly with his own patient, meticulous and economical letters to the various agents involved, also contained one to Dorothy from S. Dutton Pegram, the British Vice Consul, who with rueful asperity included the following aside in his letter. It appears that I am under an Anglo-American treaty, the person who has to try and administer the estates of British subjects who die intestate. And I can only say that, as far as I am concerned, I most assuredly hope that I never have another. This letter, dated on the 3rd of November 1958, also contains a PS in which the dry and to my ear Conradian Dutton Pegrin adds a killer last paragraph. As regards the will, two or three friends of his have told me that he mentioned to them his intention of making a will, but on being informed that it would cost about 10 bucks, he replied, I think I'll let it go. Over the years that Chick managed the affair, some of the proceeds from the sale of Fritz's assorted, assorted stocks and shares were distributed in dribs and drabs to his nephews and nieces, but clearly the agents in Eagle Pass, Texas, in Torreon, Mexico, and in San Francisco didn't or couldn't clean out the safe, except perhaps it was hinted into their own pockets. My father's efforts, increasingly irritated though never impolite, petered out in the early 1970s, soon after he'd left Lusaka, Zambia, having not had his UN contract there renewed. For me though, the jackpot is by this stage interesting only as a kind of fiction, the mirage of a silver mine or hidden treasure that has driven so many exotic and fabled expeditions. It's the kind of rider haggard King Solomon's mine story that consumed me when I was a kid. I saw the 1950 movie version with Deborah Kerr and Stuart Granger, and I had the classic comic. Later it would be Joseph Conrad's Nostromo that utterly mesmerized me, not least because I knew that Conrad had only ever seen the literal, the truthful landscape of his South American location from a distance at sea. In Fritz's story, it's the elusiveness of the treasure, not its factual truth, which is compelling. It's the drollness of the Conradian British Vice Consul's remark about Fritz's friend's anecdote. When my great uncle dismissed the need to make a will, I think I'll let it go. Who were these friends? What were they doing in Torreon, Texas, in Mexico? What was Fritz's connection to the bank in Eagle Pass? Who was the common law wife Fritz was alleged to have had? What was he doing in Mexico and why did he have an observatory? Did he really get pensioned off as a soldier in the Mexican Civil War? Recently, I caught up again with my cousin Norma in Blenheim. She said she thought she had some letters of Fritz's. It turned out that she didn't have any letters, <clears throat> but she did send me a typed page on yellowed foxed paper 
dated 1957, with a footnoted address at Apartado Postal 113 Torreon, Cajuila, Mexico, and signed in type F.A. Weddy. At first, the typed signature confused me, since the initials are also my father's. Very like my father's kind of succinct prose is the statement at the end of the sheet. Please keep this paper, as it may be of interest sometime in the future. While I have to conclude that the F.A. Weddy refers to my great uncle, Frederick Alexander Weddy, not to my father, Frederick Albert Weddy, the two identities seem to overlap, and I remain unsure as to whether the page is a transcript made by my father with his plea to posterity appended, or whether the whole thing comes down to Fritz with its final sentence reaching forward to a moment when someone, me for example, might read it. The text, however, is the only object to which I can attach Fritz in any material way. He wrote it in June 1957, not long before he died. These are his own words. I'm not surprised that they seem to emanate from the top floor of an observatory somewhere near Torreon in the state of Cajuila, Mexico, whose border with the USA runs for 512 kilometers along the Rio Grande. The truth of this seems satisfactory and even appropriate given the content of the document. Thank you. the grass catcher itself and on to the Conradian last will and testament of Uncle Fritz. Um, I'd like to invite comments and questions from the audience. Yes, please. Uh -huh. I should turn this on. Okay. Is that on? Yes. Um, it was a, an object that most of you may never have encountered. Um, um, but in the late 40s and uh, early 50s when I was a kid, they were everywhere. And this was before mass sport mowers and fly mowers and lawn mowers with engines. Um, this was when you pushed the mower up and down and it made that chattering noise with a ro rotating set of blades. Um, it, sounds, it sounds like a, um, almost like a made up thing, but it was not. It was, that was the kind of mower people had. Um, and the grass catcher was a contraption made of wire and canvas. And it just hooked onto the back. And the base of the grass catcher um, dragged along the surface of the lawn and the grass clippings went into it. And every so often, um, my father, for example, would um, unhook the grass catcher and walk with it across the back garden to the compost heap. And he would empty the grass clippings into the compost heap and then walk back and reattach it. So it was a, a very familiar object. I had to look very hard to find one to make a photograph of it for the front cover of this book <clears throat> because it's now become an historical oddity. Um, and I found one finally in, um, appropriately, an exhibition um, in the Museum of Technology in Auckland, an exhibition about home. And there was a home that was a reconstruction of a late 50s, early 1960s home in New Zealand. And there I saw the grass catcher, uh, this object. <coughs> I think because if you... Th <clears throat> if you imagine, as a kid, being in that state halfway between being awake and being asleep, and in a slightly um, um, disconnected frame of mind, and 
the grass catcher, along with some shelves of pots of paint and other stuff, occupied a place on the back wall of the garage. So when the car drove in, it lit up this sculptural space, which had a number of what were really um, strange looking objects when they were lit hard by the car's headlights. And I remember very, very clearly, uh, which is why I chose this object as the kind of open opening strategy, really, for this book. I remember very clearly that this object um, was both the thing that I knew well, because I saw my father using it every weekend. He was obsessed with mowing the lawn. Uh, not everyone in the street was obsessed with mowing the lawn. Um, he was even more obsessed than everyone else. And so I saw him you know, mowing the lawn pretty much every weekend all my childhood. And indeed later when um, I, I, for example, went and spent some time, I lived for a year in Jordan in the Middle East in 1969-70. And my father was working there at that time and I was working at the same time as he was. So I saw him, he also mowed the lawn at the front of the apartment building in Amman, on Jebel Amman to the great astonishment of the Jordanian families who lived in the apartment blocks nearby. <laughs> he put on his khaki shorts and a pair of sand shoes and he'd mow the lawn. There was no... I, I've, I don't remember the detail. No, he had a motor mower there, I think, yeah. But anyway, the thing is that this grass catcher was therefore a totally familiar, ordinary thing that I associated very much with my dad and the smell of the grass and, dare I say, the smell of his farts as he pushed it up and down. All those things that you remember vividly as a child. I mean, you know, we're all familiar with how this works. And, and these senses that you store up. Um, but when I saw it hanging up on the wall, detached from its function, detached from my father, it was weird. It was a weird thing. And it was that gap between the familiar and the weird that defined my sense of how home was not just simple. Home was also a weird place. It was a place that was at once familiar and a place that you never quite knew how it was going to work. Yeah. <laughs> you have one. Why have I written it? Um, my obsession. That's two words. Ah. What about just obsession then? Gra oh, grass catcher. Why have I written it as two words? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant why have I written the book? <laughs> <laughs> All right, two words. Ah, um, well, there was a yeah. That's I mean that's an interesting question, and <clears throat> the answer is of course um, involves the usual tormented conversations that one has with one's publishers and editors and copy editors and so on. And um, and we went back and forth with that over and over. And eventually it was decided that it to make it into two words gave it a certain emphatic quality. Um, grass catcher. And I guess for me, preferring that version was a way of preferring um, um, a, a certain solidity in the way each of those words was allowed to exist. A certain emphatic quality that the term got. Mm. Yes, please. Sarah. <laughs> Well, no, the, the, um, the, that's a really terrific question. And in fact, <coughs> um, my brother read drafts of the book as it went along. And in the process of writing it, we spent quite a bit of time sitting with bottles of wine and trying to remember stuff and quite often failing to remember stuff. But the difference between us, I mean, there's a, a little mention that I made early in that piece about left-handed, right-handed sons, daughters, etc. Um, I don't know what the 
I don't know what the physiological or medical or genealogical explanation is, but my twin brother, we're not identical twins, but my twin brother has a wonderful memory for facts. Mine is appalling. Um, he's very sanguine. I tend to the melodramatic and so on. So we, we kind of, and he's left-handed, I'm right-handed. His kids are all daughters, mine are all boys. And so there is this weird um, kind of completeness in the two of us and this weird asynchrony when we're apart. And so when we, um, or rather when I persuaded him that he should come and talk about what I was up to, he agreed. He's a very amiable man and a lovely, uh, active, fabulous man. Um, but he was a little uncomfortable and his wife was a little uncomfortable too. She thought, what's Ian up to? Um, so anyway, we sat down with a bottle of wine and <clears throat> we, would, we would talk and he would provide as much as he could a kind of factual buffer to my um, unreliable narrations. And so we did, we had a great time. But there did come a point, which was interesting, where our memories both failed. And there were some quite dark moments like that in our story where we were perhaps not happy. Um, even though he was more sanguine than me and I was more likely to make a fuss about it, we were actually together, not particularly happy all the time. And sometimes we would just go quiet and he would just fill my glass up and we'd sit there for a while and then move on. But certainly it was a book that did involve him. Um, having said that, he, he, he's not the kind of guy who would tell me to shut up. And I, he let me get away with a lot. Uh, I, I don't think he'll ever say, I don't think he'll ever tell me in detail exactly how much he finds either wrong, untruthful or disturbing. I don't think he would. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is this is the paternal German side. So um, that's Heinrich August Wetter from somewhere is what's now called Schleswig-Holstein, and Maria Riepen, Maria Katharina Josephine Riepen, my great grandmother. And these are some of their children. There were two more to come. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, da the, the Second Danish War of 1864. But Maria left in 1875. Um, what she would have seen, though, of course, after that, after the, that stage of the toing and froing of those territories would have been the occupation of Kiel by a very significant force of Prussian officers. And the interesting thing in the museum in Kiel, um, uh, there was when I went and looked, went up there and had a look around and I mean it passed for research, it wasn't, it wasn't all that diligent but <clears throat> there was an exhibition there of, uh, about the presence of the Prussian military in Kiel at that time. And it was a very satirical exhibition, I have to say. And I suspect that among the reasons my great-grandmother left was not just the presence of the military in the city, in the town, but, but the uh, uneasiness of the place around those years. It seems to come through. There was an instability around it. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, absolutely. That was very much a reason for, for, well, I had to apply for the fellowship and I had to have a plausible project. And it wasn't that I made the project <laughs> up. It was, that, it was that I'd had this project in mind for a long, long time, for many years. And um, so it was a chance to come and and, and um, not so much do 
really organized, diligent research, for example, in the Stutch Bibliothek here, although I did spend a lot of time here. It was more to try and um, encounter the ghosts in the language, the ghosts in contemporary life, the sense of what life might have been like for my great-grandmother, for example, in Kiel, when Donna and I went there for the last day of Kielwoche. It was this utter chaos of millions of people and five sound stages and um, kraut rock in one and some shanty singers in another, and it went on. And, but, I, but the wonderful thing about coming here with that idea in mind of trying to be haunted was for the first time it occurred to me that my great-grandmother's enormous adventure, which I'd always been flabbergasted by, needed to be rethought a little, because, not just because of Kielwoche, but by being in a place like that and seeing historical documents, for example, a lithograph I saw in the Maritime Museum there, of a young sailor's first return after his first voyage, and it's a very carefully staged and very familiar kind of historical work, um, kind of historical image, where he's sitting at a table with his mother leaning forward very intently towards him, and he's telling her a story about his adventures in the South Seas. And of course, in, in the conventions of history painting, there is his bag lying on the floor, and it's open and spilling out of it, in, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of history paintings use this narrative technique. Spilling out of it are a number of objects that stand for um, where he's been and the adventures he's had and so on. And amongst the objects that are spilling out of this young sailor's bag were a mere from New Zealand and a big conch shell and another big conch shell that one of his sisters is listening to the sound of the Pacific in and so on. So I, I thought... Actually, Maria's experience living in Kiel in the 1850s, 60s, she would have heard a lot of foreign languages. She would have seen Delft ware, the product of trade with Asia coming ashore. She would have seen uh, people wearing tattoos. I mean, Berlin, so who cares? But back then in Kiel in 1864, maybe that was something else. And so perhaps it was not so entirely strange for her to get on a ship and go somewhere. Uh, whereas if you came from an inland town in Germany, a small town that was separated off, that wasn't on a river, that wasn't on the coast, that didn't have this kind of traffic, it would have been a much more extraordinary thing to have done. And so from that point of view, um, Yes, coming here and being able to just sense the presence of my grandmother's experience in the contemporary world uh, was, was really wonderful. It was amazing. Mm. And I saw my great-grandfather's ghost on a boat that I, I went on a quick trip around the fjord. And he was wearing um, a wind cheetah with an ocean race logo on it smoking a Marlboro filter tip cigarette. <laughs> and he turned around and looked at me as we passed the Thiessen um, submarine base. And he spat his cigarette into the wake of the boat and gave me this look with his blue Baltic eyes and cursed. And I thought, that's my great-grandfather. <laughs>
way my brothers and my childhood worked. We saw our parents very seldom after the age of nine or ten, every three years perhaps. And so I knew no, almost nothing about my family. Um, and I didn't care. I mean, I was, you know, you have, to, you have to have been alive for a certain length of time before you begin to be interested in these things. Um, and then I heard these little fragments of story about um, my great-grandparents, Maria and, um, and Heinrich, and the family romance that had been built around them, jump, um, Heinrich jumping ship, deserting from his ship in order to marry Maria. It was a great romance. It's actually not quite like that. but um, Anyway, the family always loved this story. And so we had these little bits and pieces of story. And Fritz was another one. And um, I mean, I, I had no reason not to believe what I was told, but I did find it hard uh, to believe that Fritz, it was believed by some of the family, um, had managed, even with the name Weda, to join the expeditionary forces at the beginning of the First World War and come to Germany um, as a soldier with the New Zealand forces, whereupon it was believed he had deserted from the New Zealand forces and had joined the other side. Whereupon, uh, with a quantity of valuable materiel, it was said, he had a commercial impulse, whereupon it was said he then deserted from the German side again and took with him again a quantity of valuable material of some sort and ended up in Torreon in Mexico, having fought in the Spanish War of Liberation the Mexican War of Liberation run. Uh, it was a wonderful story and it totally entranced me. I wished it was true, but I had a, a little doubt about it. And as it turned out, of course, Fritz did not join the expeditionary forces and he did not desert from both. And yet he did end up in Mexico living in an observatory and running an orphanage in the bottom part of it and writing this extraordinary treatise about um, atomic particles which was the document that I mentioned. Um, now, I had this a little bit of the story, the fragments of that bit of the story in mind, but then when I was, as it coincidentally, in living in Jordan at the same time as my father was working there, um, we, we were both sheltering in the basement of the apartment building during the first stage of the civil war that broke out in 1969 between the Fedayeen and the Hashemite forces. And so, there we were, for the first time in our lives. Actually, we had no choice but to talk to each other. And um, we didn't have very much apart from a supply of bottled water and some minimal f food, but there was a crate of whiskey. And so we sat there while the war went on, and the sound of gunfire, which reminded my father of his adventure as a young man in the war, in the Second World War. The first time he'd gone to Palestine, and to Italy and to Egypt, and it unlocked something in him. So we sat there and to calm our nerves, we had a scotch, and he began to talk about Uncle Fritz. And he told me the story um, about Fritz, and then subsequently I inherited the papers that were associated with the family's attempts to extract the fortune which had been collared by the rogue lawyers in Eagle Pass and so on. And so Fritz became this, um, he, he came to stand for the rogue element in the family. And yet for me, what was extremely interesting was that he seemed only typical in a way. He was a bit extreme and um, certainly, you know, not all members of the family took off and did such crazy stuff. But he stood for something about those kinds of people who came to places like New Zealand and Australia and the New World. These were not people who preferred to stay at home. Even if their circumstances had been appalling, as with the Irish potato famine, or any number of other reasons, I mean, even now, more these days, even if they had been, in effect, refugees, <coughs> people like my great-grandparents and their uh, son, Fritz, had somehow, it seemed to me, in them a wandering proclivity. They were people whose horizons were over there, not at the picket fence between them and their neighbour. They were people who were 
given to go somewhere else. And Fritz was an exaggerated kind of hyperbolic version of that. And that was why he fascinated me and that's why I felt, I, you know, I couldn't resist telling his slightly dodgy story. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's a good point to move on to the little lake. Ah, okay. Yeah. Can I have a yeah, sure. drink of water? Thank you. Thank you all for um, interrupting and asking questions. It's, um, it makes it much easier for me, I have to tell you. Um, now, a, a, a kind of word of warning. Um, the thing I'm going to read just some bits and pieces from now is um, it, it began um, it began with a um, the idea of coming here and and just every day or every other <coughs> every other day at least <coughs> picking up a fragment of language or an observation that was to do really with that idea of being haunted of hearing he hearing these people in the present not trying to um, imagine what their life was like in the 1860s or 70s, although I did do quite a lot of that in this excellent library, and that was fascinating too. But I wanted also to get a sense of how they were still here in some way. <clears throat> and so um, the project at first had a very clumsy, clunky name. It was called... Um, Thick Description, a German notebook, and um, I'm very grateful to my wife Donna for pointing out that that was a really bad idea. Um, but of course it, it sheets back to um, the term that was developed in the essays that I've always loved greatly uh, of Clifford Geertz from the 60s and the 70s in which he used um, the term thick description to describe an approach to um, ethnography and anthropology where you, you look at detailed fragments um, organised in a kind of vertical way in order to understand how things were and how society works, um, rather than kind of large overarching ideas. Um, um, but anyway, it's no longer called thick description, but I thought I should mention that because that's really the, method, the methodology here. It's now called the little ache. And it's, that's just the sensation I had when, particularly when I thought about my great-grandmother, Maria Riepen, a little heartache, the thought of her coming ashore in Wellington in 1876, probably not speaking English, um, um, working as a maid in a house um, where she may not have perhaps been considered a part of the family, um, she had nine kids, and life can't have been easy. Um, but there was an awful lot of other stuff going on around her that um, I became really fascinated by as I found out more about it. And so, as well as it being an investigation of where are these ghosts, what, what can I hear of them now as I go out in the morning and have a coffee, or sit in the sun in Boxhagener Park and look at the kind of resident drunk and his dog and imagine sort of how they relate to my family history. It, it, was, also, um, it was also to do with a, a, a consideration of what did they leave behind and what did they bring with them. And some of those things I knew about, but of course there was an awful lot I didn't know about. And um, so it began with a mis... Um, um, uh, a little event when I arrived in Berlin at the very beginning, um, I forgot to pick up my bag, and that seemed to me to be a good place to start. Vergiss deine Tasche nicht. Don't forget your bag. My great grandfather Heinrich August Weddy's ghostly admonition at Berlin Tegel customs clearance. But I did distracted by what might have been the irritable clatter in the galley, 
where my ancestor was heating soup as the Robin Hood leaned across an ebb tide out of some harbour in Poitou Charente, whose meandering deltas may have reminded him of the waterways of his first debouche out of Kiel or Hamburg, a kid with horizons in his eyes, with Goethe in his kit, but no idea where he'd be lugging the Faust my father heard him shouting from the bed he took to on pension night with a skin full of schnapps at York Terrace in Blenheim. The same bed where pneumonia silenced his Mordersprach after he was pushed into the river, some say, where he was peacefully fishing in 1915 because he was German. How thick is the space between what Heinrich had in his bag and what he left behind, or just forgot, as it may be, about the time he jumped ship from the Lammerschagen in Wellington Harbour in 1875, making himself scarce upcountry at such time as he came back after a prudent year with his bag and its frugal contents to marry my great-grandmother Maria Josephine Katharina Riepen of the straight back and forthright gaze. I recover my bag from an amused customs official at Berlin's Tegel Airport and make my way into the city which seems both foreign and not, perhaps like Heinrich August, caring little about the difference between what I carry and what I don't. In the courtyard outside my new home, a chestnut tree drops wads of wet brown leaves, and I'm only a little tempted by the folly of wondering if it forgets them for the fresh ones it will grow in spring. Rocks on the one hand and dreams on the other, they are things of this world. It's a quote from Clifford Geertz. I wake up from a dream about my father, Frederick Albert Weddy, whose name was both a dream my great-grandfather brought ashore in his bag and the thing I touched when I said goodbye to the stone-cold body of Heinrich's grandson that was no longer my father, who'd become a kind of inscription. Heinrich August and Maria Josephine Katharina, their children, Reinhold Henry, William Frederick, Elisabeth Frederica, Bertha Mary, Albert Augustus, my grandfather, Frederick Alexander, Hermann Conrad, Herbert Edward. Min Modersprach war klingst du schön. My mother tongue, how sweet you sound, wrote Klaus Groth, 1819 to 1899. The founder of Plattdeutsch dialect literature, so I'm told, by the Lowlands iNet website, where my distant relative appears in a portrait with wavy silver hair, which I imagine will be repeated by the statue of him I've heard about somewhere in Kiel, up there on the freezing Baltic coast, where his head's been crowned with snow in the hometown of his cousin, my great-grandmother, Maria Josephine Katharina, which I hope to visit when the weather warms up and the distinguished locks of Klaus Groth will have thawed to the auburn tint of bronze as if hennered in defiance of time. I arrived with little enough German in my kit, let alone the sort Klaus loved, as if language was a mother at whose breast he'd drunk speech, which his friend Brahms made into songs, sung by Maria's sister, Sophie, who cut some ice as a soprano in the operatic world up there. How much English did Maria come ashore with in 1875? 
And was it the Brahms settings of Groth's Modersprach that she sang while taking loaves from the oven in the drafty kitchen in Butte Street, Wellington, while an icy southerly rattled the windows, weder dicht noch schön. I should explain that last, weder dicht noch schön. Um, Frau Angela Merkel was once asked, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this story, but just in case you're not, was once asked what it was that um, she saw characterized, encapsulated German, the German quality, the essential quality, and her reply was Dichter und schöner Fenster, nice, well-fitted windows. It's actually a very deep thing, if you consider it. I think it's extraordinary. <clears throat> Fünf Narren jeden Tag, five fools every day, said the smiling customs official, when I went to pick up the bag I'd forgotten, along with most of the German, I was taught by Robert Lübke in 1956 when my brain was young and I learned without trying. But 58 years later, I remembered enough to reply, und jetzt der sechste, and now the sixth, surprising myself as I wheeled my bag out the door. The last time I saw Robert was in 1995 in Hamburg. He was 90 years old and wept politely into the handkerchief he'd prepared for that purpose as we said goodbye at the station. He waved the same handkerchief as the train pulled out, which was typical of Professor Lupka's philological precision, as if his handkerchief were language capable of various careful deployments. Likewise, his discourse over lunch, fresh Spargel and a glass of Riesling, which was of Johann Gottlieb Fichter and his belief in the social nature of self-knowledge, which my old teacher explained to me in between vigorously chewing the way I remembered him chewing words, for example, on jetzt der sechste, little bit of spit. I'm told that my great uncle Reinhold, known as Wren or Dick, born in 1877 in Butte Street, Wellington, the oldest of my grandfather's siblings, lived out his days in Auckland in the house of my second cousin, Peter, arriving from the king country with a cabin trunk, which he had not forgotten to fill with the complete works of Fichter, and needless to say, therefore, also of Kant, whose difficult style and dense language Johann Gottlieb was sometimes accused of mimicking. In whose bag did those books come ashore? And where are they now? And by whom were they forgotten? And what did my great-grandmother, Maria Riepen, choose to forget? And Heinrich August, what did he leave behind on a day when someone waved a handkerchief from the wharf at Kiel or Hamburg as jetzt der nächste Narr shipped out looking for the horizon beyond which he might come to know himself among different people. Um, there were two of uh, my male ancestors whose works are contained in the Staatsbibliothek here. One is Klaus Groth, whom I've mentioned, who was a, a poet um, who wrote a, a quite a famous book, in the 18, published a famous book in 1856 um, in Plattdeutsch, and then um, another book somewhat later in Hochdeutsch called 100 Blätter, 100 Leaves, which sank without trace, um, for good reason. Uh, just terrible poet, actually. Um, and then there was another very interesting ancestor, um, Johannes Vedi, who was a, a social democrat and newspaper editor in Hamburg, um, whom I found. The, I was the first person to open his book, open his book in 103 years. And it caused a outfit of, an outbreak of terrible sneezing when I opened it. It was full of fine. And 
If you've ever worked in the reading room in this library or in the Unter den Linden branch, you know that if you have a big sneezing attack, you, get, you have to leave. Anyway, so um, uh, there's a few sections here about um, Johannes and a couple about um, Klaus Groth. Um, der kleine Mann mit dem interessanten ausdrucksvollen Kopf auf einem leider verwachsenen Körper war ein glühender Sozialdemokrat, konnte aber erst später öffentlich als solcher auftreten. Why do we say the ghost of a smile? And why did I ask myself that when what I saw was the smile of a ghost on the interesting expressive face of the little firebrand with the sharp blue eyes who was talking with fluent zeal in the association of left publishers precinct at the Leipzig book fair. The little man with the interesting expressive head on an unfortunately deformed body could have been the ghost of the social democrat described by Wilhelm Josef Bloch, 1849 to 1827, and his Denkwürdigkeiten eines Sozial Demokraten, memorabilia of a social democrat, first published in 1914 when Bloch was already 65 and lived to be 78, whereas the little withered man, my distant relative, Friedrich Christoph Johannes Wetter died in 1890 at the age of 47. In seiner mit Geist und Humor gewürste Konversation, I recognize the alert and humor spiced conversation of my living cousins, as if our remote Wetter still refused to shut up. However, in seiner oft sehr hübschen Versa, konnten wegen des gelehrten Ballastes, mit dem sie gepackt waren, nicht in die Masse dringen. It's the ghost of a smile I see when I read what Josef Bloß thought of Johannes Weddy's poems, which, though often very beautiful, didn't sink in with the wider public on account of the scholarly ballast with which they were packed. Valle Regen, Valle Nieder, Wecke meiner alten Lieder, die wir in die Türe sangen, wie die Tropfen draußen klangen. Pour rain, pour down, awaken my old songs, which we sang in the doorway when the drops rang outside. The Brahms setting of Regenlied, received by the poet Klaus Groth in 1873, is said to have had an emotional effect on Clara Schumann, though which of the words or the music moved her more is a subversive question at best, since she knew well enough that when Klaus wrote of raindrops falling, tears would usually follow as melancholia follows memory, and not least the memory of her husband, poor Robert Schumann, dead at 46, speechless, but sung to by angels. Schweiß und Blut. But when Johannes Wede writes of sweat and blood falling rather than raindrops, in his panegyric to the Paris Commune Martyrs of 1871, <coughs> he anticipates an awakening in the fresh bosom of youth. He drives memory forward into hope, growth backwards into melancholy. Johannes looks outward to the future, Klaus inward to the past. They are the antiphonal ghosts that sing to me, some days chicken salad, some days chicken shit. And then on a warm evening, nine going on ten, the light fading, Boxhagener Park full of people with dogs and children, 
a punk girl band singing a cover of polystyrene's Day That Time Forgot, just shutting the ghosts up. Thank you. Taking us from the alien, unfamiliar shores of Tegel Airport through the Dichte Schöne Fenster and up to Boxhagener Platz. Um, it sounds like it's a very polyglot poem, and it sounds like you really, really relish the German language. You discovered a few beautiful phrases there. How does that relate to it's a, German is your second language, and how would you say that relates to, to the, the feeling of alienness, the feeling of strangeness that you, that you probably felt in a, in a new place to, to live, such as Berlin? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Well, first of all, my German is um, not very good. <clears throat> um, and I, 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 I studied German. I mean, I learned German under very peculiar circumstances as a kid. Mm. And that's where the story of Robert Lupke comes in. Because um, when my brother and I were seven, my mother and father, for reasons which um, they never entirely explained, but I'm fairly confident that it was in their case, an aspect of that <clears throat> let's get the hell out of here motivation that drove my ancestors to come all the way down. I mean, it's 36 hours on a plane now. You, what was it like then? Um, so they decided they had to get the hell out of Blenheim. And um, so they ended up in what's now Bangladesh, um, East Pakistan, up the Karnafuli River. It was about as far away from anywhere as you could get. And, <clears throat> and after we'd been there for a while, my mother decided she couldn't handle correspondence school anymore. There were three or four families of, um, of um, European uh, management people there and half a dozen families of Bengali kids as well. And the, the, the company agreed to get a, t a tutor to come over. And um, Herr Professor, Professor, Professor Robert Lübke turned up with his wife, Magdalena, a wonderful man, and he taught us. But what he mostly taught us was French and German. So at the age of nine, ten, seven, eight, nine, ten, thereabouts, um, I learned a reasonable amount of German. So as you do at that age, it sinks, certain amount of it sinks in. Um, but when I came back, To, and I went on and did a bit of German subsequently, but when I arrived here, um, it, uh, towards the when November last year, October last year, I thought I had more German than I did, and it was a terrible shock to me to discover just how little I did have. And I'm sure this is a really common experience for people who come here with a bit of language. Um, at first, I, you know, I went down to the market in Boxhagener Park on a Saturday and it transacted in the German that I believed was adequate. And uh, the woman I was attempting to <coughs> transact with at the vegetable stall, she really tore into me. Um, we became very good friends subsequently. I mean, in as much as you become not an intimate friend, but we, we, we got to know each other quite well. But man, I mean, the first time she told me off, And, and so it's true, there was a, <coughs> there was a sense of, of um, being haunted by language in that I knew a little bit and I could get by, but I certainly um, was an alien in language. And after a while it, has, it, does have, it does have an extraordinary effect on you. It can be at once challenging, it can also of course be quite dispiriting. Um, at times. But for me, given the thing I was trying to think about and work on, the person I kept thinking about over and over again was my great-grandmother. And that's the little ache. That's where the little ache comes from, that little piece of heartbreak that you feel when you yourself have, you know, um, aggressive woman in the fruit market telling you that you 
saying it wrong. Um, but also I just kept imagining my great-grandmother walking through Wellington with her beginning to have fragments of English. And how on earth was that? What was that like? Um, and it may be that there was a German society of, of immigrant people or something in Wellington. I don't know. I, have to, I would like to go and find that out. But I kept thinking about her. I kept thinking about the, the constant little pain that she must have felt, and sometimes probably the very considerable pain that she would have felt sometimes. So it was a piece of the haunting, yeah. Mm. Questions and comments from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, Lutheran one, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm. Um, no, I don't. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I, at one stage, I thought that Maria had uh, come to the south of the world with two sisters who went to Australia. She went on to New Zealand. But I've searched the shipping records and every other possible record that I can find, and it doesn't seem to be the case. She came by herself. <coughs> and um, interestingly, the shipping records that I found in Hamburg uh, reveal that she left from a town in Denmark, not from Kiel, which is where... So, uh, I mean, that border was a porous one, and there was ongoing strife of one kind or another over the two wars and then the subsequent... Bismarck period and so on, um, but it's possible that um, she she uh, there were what ten nine ten kids in that family. Um, they were her father was a cabinet maker, so he was in German society, was um, a guild member of the guild class. So you know he was thoroughly respectable, but not wealthy. Um, and it may be that there were very few resources for those children for that big family. Was a and there was a famine, yeah, yeah in when early 60s. end of the 60s, wasn't it? Um, and so she probably had to find employment and she probably went to a household in, in the town of Denmark that is registered as the place she left from. I don't know. I mean, the rest of the record, the rest of the story is not easy to find. It yes, it was, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. No, I have found those records for my great grandmother, and you know the entries that, that describe the conditions under which she was a passenger, but why she left, I. Why New Zealand? Most people who left from Hamburg went, of course, to Ellis Island and to the States. Um, not so many came to New Zealand and Australia. I don't know. There seems to have been no destination reason that I can find. Although the family, of course, believed that she and my great-grandfather effectively conspired or eloped to run away together, but that seems not to have been true, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, any more questions, comments? Talking a lot about ghosts in, in both volumes, actually. Um, and I think there was one instance, uh, Klaus Groth and the, and the raindrops, and uh, sort of moving towards into, into tears, and, and Johannes Weddy and the blood and sweat and, and uh, tears, and then finally the, the punk band shutting the ghosts up. Uh, what are the instances where, where the ghosts were especially visible in Berlin or especially present? Can you pinpoint um, sort of any... I, I mean, once mm. you get yourself into that way of thinking, it happens all the time. And mm. it's slightly morbid, but, you know, because it's slightly morbid, it's also fun. Um, 
And I just found it was constantly happening to me. I, because I got myself into this imaginative state where I kept, for example, seeing my great-grandfather on the tour ferry that went around uh, Kila Fjord. Um, but um, I, you know, riding my bike through the Plantewald in a Treptower Park by the Spree, and there would be a man fishing. It was my grandfather, my great grandfather. I mean, I just, there he was. Um, um, I don't know. It's hard to describe. I think it's really, um, it's a very unreliable research position to be in. And yet, I think it's also an extremely accurate way of describing what haunting is, when in fact you're looking for where the voices in the language, the traces in the stories, um, the bits and pieces of the environment, the weather, um, goodness knows what, where where does that somehow escape from its present, escape from the time that you know in your rational mind you're in and begin to drift across history into the place where your ancestors lived? And to me it was something that began to happen a lot, especially in the early stages when I was first here before Donna, my wife, arrived and I was by myself and I inhabited this... Um, it's kind of unattached, um, a historical fantasy kind of world for a while. I couldn't, I couldn't go on doing that. I mean, I would turn into a complete nutcase. But, um, but it was great for a while. Yeah. Yeah, in a way, yes. Um, I mean, working here and reading those texts, and which was hard for me because, especially reading the old German script, I needed to get help from a friend who <coughs> who works at or used to work at the um, uh, Free University in Dahlem. But um, Sometimes it would be so. It would be very vivid. A sense of um, the presence of this person in the text, in the book. Um, really, more particularly here. The other kind of ambiguous. Don't know quite where these ghosts are. Experience the man fishing by the spree or whatever. Um, um, but it, actually, sitting here with the books in front of me and turning the pages and having to peer at them really hard and try and work out how it worked and having to look words up. Um, you know, I would perhaps spend two hours and not know how long it had been. And it was a kind of, it wasn't particularly organized research, but it was incredibly, uh, it was mesmerizing, yeah. They sort of go into a kind of trance state in a way. Mm. Okay. Yes, one more. Sorry, I can't hear. Uh. I, I'm, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, my guess is that having wanted to do this for a long time and having done it in the way it turned out, uh, which I couldn't really have predicted, um, I'll feel a bit at peace with it when I go back to New Zealand. But um, it's also quite possible that the reverse will happen, that I'll take all this baggage, as it were, I'll take the full bag back with me, and I'll have all that stuff with me in that place now where it wasn't before. Um, I, I, I don't know, Sarah, I really you know, can't tell. I kind of hope the latter, 
you know, I hope the ghosts will come on the plane with me on Monday. Yeah. Beautiful final word. Thank you very much. I think it's time for a drink. Yes, and unfortunately we have to... <laughs> And uh, just finally, I, I have to thank um, Jochen. It was a complete, one, one of those wonderful accidents that uh, we met because I was in here and I'd registered, I got my card, I was all ready to, you know, rock on with the research. And I couldn't actually make the system work for me. So I went to the help desk and, and then I went back to the help desk and guess who was there? The person who's in charge of, amongst many other things, the New Zealand literary collection of this library. Oh, right, so. It was, um, it, it was ordained in some way. That was well, we're just, we're just talking about serendipity and that kind of thing happens in libraries quite a lot and, uh -huh. and in research, so, but it anyway, it very, 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 very special case and very special coincidence, definitely. Thanks so much, Ian, for, for doing this. I think we're all looking forward to, to reading The Grass Catcher and to reading The Little Lake when it's, when it's published. And unfortunately, we have to close the building at nine. This is my sad duty uh, to, to inform you of this. Um, and since the New Zealand Embassy has generously provided New Zealand wine and since there are many, many beautiful books on sale and since um, I think there are lots of things to talk, I'd like to close the official part of the event and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for your atten attention and your questions and your comments and hope to see you outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.